Good evening, everyone. My name is Kevin Butterfield. I'm the executive director of the Fred W. Smith National Library for the Study of George Washington at Mount Vernon. Welcome to our Ford Evening Book Talk for the month of April 2021. Thrilled to have you here uh, and excited about our conversation on the first inauguration, George Washington and the Invention of the Republic with Stephen Brown. Uh, one note, uh, coming up in May will be our third and final Michelle Smith lecture. Uh, we've had two wonderful conversations with Len Cheney and with Thomas Ricks. Uh, thus far, uh, separate tickets are available for this final conversation. R remember that ticket, uh, if, you, if you select the, the, the ticket that I'm thinking of, uh, will include an autographed copy of the book shipped to you directly at home. Uh, Richard Bernstein, uh, R.B. Bernstein, uh, noted author and great scholar of the founding era, has a new book called The Education of John Adams. I'm excited to talk with him about it. Please join us for our third and final segment of the 2021 Michelle Smith Lecture Series. Um, to introduce a little bit of our uh, about our, our speaker tonight, and of course we'll learn more as we join the conversation, uh, Stephen Brown is a liberal arts uh, professor of communication arts and sciences at Penn State. He's a rhetorical critic, particular interest in public memory, early America. In fact, his most recent book before the book we'll be talking about tonight was The Ides of War, George Washington, and the Newburgh Crisis. Uh, he's written many books, uh, but we're mostly excited about this one uh, as we near the anniversary of the first inaugural address ever given by the first president of the United States. We're going to talk with him tonight about the first inauguration, George Washington and the invention of the Republic. He's a noted scholar, uh, a, an award-winning scholar, uh, both by Penn State as a, as a marvelous teacher, uh, but also by the National Communication Association. Please join me in welcoming Stephen Howard Brown. Stephen, welcome. Hi, Kevin. It's so great to be here. You know, for anyone who's interested in Washington, this is the gold standard. So I, I feel very grateful to, to you and the staff, the library, and of course, the ladies. Uh, so thank you. Well, yes, thank you. And and it's on behalf of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association that we're welcoming you here tonight and the Ford Motor Company that's been funding these talks for years. So uh, thank you for noting the ladies. Uh, they support this work and everything that we do at Mount Vernon. Uh, and I'm thrilled to have this conversation with you. Uh, so I want to remind everyone out there, please be submitting your questions. I want to uh, give you an opportunity to ask questions of our author tonight uh, and learn about the first inaugural address, uh, but also really about the first inauguration more broadly. And let me start there, Stephen. Tell us a little bit about the, the election of the president. The very first election of the president was not like any other. Uh, how did George Washington become elected president in 1788-89? Right. Well, thank you. Um, uh, you know, maybe uh, I want to honor the question, but uh, maybe one way of getting at it is to ask uh, uh, how would it be possible for him not to uh, have, have become uh, e elected uh, through, a, as you know, and uh, familiar to uh, to our listeners and viewers, he was in some ways uh, almost a pure composite of precisely those uh, kinds of values. Um, not only that people uh, embraced, but needed uh, to embrace uh, at that moment, and and people knew it. Um, for, from from uh, v Vermont to Georgia, it, it was very clear, of course, that uh, this was precisely the the person um, who not only embodied the values, but right here, right now, on the precipice when things were very unclear, even in perhaps especially in uh, eighty nine. I mean, it's interesting to note, you know, that a day after the uh, inaugural address, uh, of course, the Estates General uh, are uh, convened in, in Paris, and uh, in a couple of months, we'll have the Bastille, and then we're off and running, right? So it's a very uncertain uh, and scary world out there, and, and Washington is ballast uh, to the sail. We at Mount Vernon uh, talk about, and maybe you could tell us a little bit about the the, the, the environment in which Washington is waiting for the news. Uh, yes. That he's been elected president. Uh, now, I think we know, and he knew, that he was going yes. to be elected president. Yes, uh, right. Sure, and so there is something of a, 
of a uh, of a ritualistic character uh, to some of this, uh, given what what you, you you just said that people knew it and 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 here it comes and it's it's, it's a certainty um, and indeed uh, uh, Charles Thompson, the Secretary of Congress, is sent on his way to make a rather long uh, ride uh, d d down to Mount Vernon. So all of that is clear and indeed Thompson shows up on the 16th. He rounds his way to the door and uh, and Washington uh, is ready. Uh, and uh, something of the two uh, of a two-step dance then follows, where Thompson reads him a sort of an official um, statement uh, from Congress of, <clears throat> of congratulations, and Washington, of course, then turns right around and, and reads a, a, a statement uh, back to him. So there's something of that. Um, at the same time, um, Washington. Well, I'll put it this way, the, the great historian Joe Ellis has this beautiful uh, uh, set of beautiful observations about uh, Washington as a virtuoso in the art of the exit. You know, the man really knew how to take his leave, right? And, and absolutely, um, uh, that's true. And it reminds us of the sort of a stagecraft that, that Washington was uh, so good at. Fair enough, but he was also, um, really good at uh, making an entrance. <laughs> so that's a, that's an art uh, unto itself, and so something of the um, of the theater, I think, is going on here. Not not to trivialize or or, or to empty it. Uh, quite the opposite. Um, I think Washington, for all his rough and ready camp away, uh, you know. Uh, uh, you know, eating uh, cheese and nuts and wine over the campfire. The man had a very acute and, and developed sense of the theater of politics. And he understood that under the circumstances, he needed to do this right every step, literally, uh, along the way. And so when Thompson knocks on the door, that's act one, scene one. Let's go. Is there is there a, a fear in Washington's part of seeming uh, presumptuous? Is that part of what's going on here, or what 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 are his concerns about making the wrong step? Right, right. Um, um, yeah, yeah, very point, uh, very suggestive uh, question, um, and and uh, as. Evidence for what what I uh, am about to say, um, I invoke, and, and as I, I certainly encourage uh, everyone who's listening and watching, who who, who has access um, uh, to the Washington Papers, the great UVA collection. Of course, there's which is one of the most amazing works of scholarship uh, on earth. I, I swear. In any case, what we have is a really nice paper trail to, to answer your question of. Yeah thinking and writing as the uh, the impending news comes, you know, and it is, um, it's, it's, it's sprinkled with these kinds of things. Um, famously, he, he writes to, um, to uh, General Knox uh, uh, beforehand, uh, very quickly says, uh, I feel not unlike those, uh, my feelings are not unlike those of a culprit who's going uh, to the place of his own execution. You know, so there's that kind of talk and, and the kind of uh, um, d d d diminishing of expectations and, and I'm not worthy and, 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 and that kind of thing. But again, I don't think it trivializes or, or empties it to say that's part of the stagecraft. I mean, it's important for a um, soon to be a chief executive uh, of, of a republic, uh, of a Republican government, um, to play that down, to play the power down, uh, uh, to, to, to play up the, the longing, the, the, the appeal of home, of Mount Vernon. Um, so, so it's part of that, um, um, that choreography of power that I think he was so good at. Once yeah. he makes this decision, and of course he, yeah. he announces it to Charles Thompson that he will uh, journey to become uh, the, the first president. Uh, there, there is a journey uh, worthy of of, 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 yeah. of, of some attention, uh, and of course he's leaving from Mount Vernon and going to what turns out to be a very short-lived capital uh, of New York City. Right. Uh, yes. so let's talk about this journey. Let's go into some detail because your book uh, has uh, some great detail on the, the 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 travels of George Washington, but more importantly, what happens along the way. 
uh, in terms of how people are receiving. Right. Uh, so once he leaves uh, Mount Vernon, uh, set the stage for us. Uh, what 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 will this journey entail? Uh, does right. he uh, go with a large entourage or a small group? Right. Tell us right. about. It. Good. Thank you. And and I'll remind myself to to restrain myself because this is really, in some ways, this is what uh, compelled me into the in, into the project. Generally, was uh, was frankly a road trip. Everybody loves a road trip. I know. Yeah. I at least so so uh, how does this work well he's got to slim it down and he's a military man um, and so he's he's, he's going to travel light um, so he's just got a couple of fellows Thompson um, and and Humphreys and and they'll, they'll, they'll keep that 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 pretty lean um, and so uh, off they go right well they don't get far um, indeed uh, uh, for your listeners and viewers uh, uh, who are familiar with uh, Alexandria, uh, you'll know what is, uh, I think it's 12 miles or, or something like that, uh, uh, give or take. And that's that's as far as they get before the first of many uh, occasions in which um, uh, Washington is feted, of, of course, uh, along his way. And I promise not to do this uh, every step or anything, but, um, uh, but I, if you don't mind, um, um, I'd, I'd like to convey something of what uh, uh, of what goes down in Alexandria uh, uh, at the at the tavern um, uh, as a sort of a representative of what um, uh, is to transpire for, for the next week or so. Uh, but of course, Alexandria isn't just any old stop along the way, as as, uh, as we all know. Um, it's, it's close to his heart, and so um, this is just a, a, a paragraph, if, if you don't mind. They. They have a big, old, a big meal for them, um, and uh, the, some speeches by local worthies, and uh, as you might guess, and, and they're they're quite good. And then Washington, um, here's how he concludes his comments: <clears throat> All that remains for me is to commit myself and you to the protection of that beneficent being, who on a former occasion hath happily brought us together after a long and distressing separation. Perhaps the same gracious providence will again indulge us with the same heartfelt felicity. But words, my fellow citizens, fail me. Unutterable sensations must then be left to more expressive silence. While from an aching heart, I bid you all my affectionate friends and kind neighbors, farewell. That's good. That's pretty good, <laughs> you know. Um, and uh, I wish I could tell from the evidence um, on what occasions he actually stood up and and, and delivered these uh, himself. It's unclear to me. Sometimes uh, uh, more uh, more careful uh, searchers amongst us here uh, this evening might uh, straighten me out on this, but it's unclear whether sometimes uh, he is, as I say, delivering these as one might a, a speech or or is uh, delivered in sort of written form and, and that kind of thing. But either way, that is an exquisite sentiment. And, and then so off they go, right? Um, it's uh, it's qu it's quite a journey. It's not actually all all, all that long, uh, it, it, you know. Easy for easy for me to say, but as you know, and as the, uh, as your exhibits at, at at Mount Vernon have these great uh, sort of trails uh, along the way, but but the first Alexandria, and then. Uh, with uh, stops along the way, but he'll he'll uh, go hit Baltimore, of course, where there's also um, uh, big celebrations and, and sort of the rituals of power that uh, that I had mentioned uh, into um, into Delaware, uh, Wilmington, and then into um, across the Schuylkill uh, into Philly. That's crazy um, as far as that goes. Um, I look at the commentary you know from the day and even some scholarly um, <laughs> coverage of that and uh, so sometimes the estimates are around 10,000 people uh, turning out well Philly at the most um, had but uh, 30 or give or take 30,000 right which would mean that a third of the entire city uh, turned out um, I, I'll go with it it seems like a lot but uh, so, so there we have on, on, on the visual there what would be um, there are several of these uh, 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 sort of um, 
what would you call them? These, these, these sort of, uh, is sort of the architecture of celebration where, where you have the, the laurel wreathed, uh, arch, uh, then the bridge and, and the, the music. And sometimes you'd see a, a say a detachment from the local a militia or something like that. Um, and so this is, uh, Washington, a depiction of Washington, um, crossing the Schuylkill. Uh, into uh, in, in, into Philadelphia for those of you familiar with 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 that area. So this would be uh, this would be characteristic. Um, that is th uh, theater in the best sense, I think. You know, um, and we can talk about that later. But what's going on here is it seems to me is uh, in this occasion, as indeed through the whole trip itself, is a kind of uh, it seems to me this is. Um, interpretive on my part for sure, but it's not altogether clear because nothing is what exactly all this should look like. I mean, we fast forward, for instance, what, 12 years or so to uh, Jefferson's first inaugural, and he's living in a boarding house off the Capitol. You know, he, he gets up, has a cup of tea and ties his hair back in a ponytail and brushes himself off and walks, you know. Well, okay, that's that. But here in, in, in April of 89, um, before there is a president after all, it's unclear what the dramaturgy of power ought to look like. Should it be like a royal procession? like the Brits might do or the French, Lord knows, uh, and just, you know, over the top. Uh, all of, well, that you can't really do that. On the other hand, you don't want to downplay it uh, too much because this is, after all, uh, a, a, a rapidly, right, well, very soon become a nation state amongst a very bumptious and, and uh, aggressive and appetitive uh, world out there. So you don't want to downplay yourself. So this is um, seems to be to me to be a sort of a modulation between European excess and poor mouthing it, <laughs> if you know what I yeah. you know. It's, it's somewhere in between, and so this he'll okay. Then here he, he, he they stay in Philly um, for Philadelphia for uh, a, a stretch, you know, because everybody wants a piece of the action, right? So you're going to have the um, trustees of the University of Pennsylvania. Alcohol. Um, and uh, oh, oh, the um, Society of the Cincinnati and the aldermen and, and various uh, parties um, want in on the deal and, and they want his ear uh, and they want to listen to him. And so we get a rehearsal of what we saw in a sense in Alexandria, uh, more complicated and, and, and less uh, intimate uh, perhaps, but, um, uh, but, um, but still the, the same sort of offering up of language befitting a Republican city, Philadelphia, after all, you gotta, you gotta play this right. This is Philadelphia. <laughs> um, and it's uh, afterwards, then the, the second part of the dance is then Washington will deliver um, a, a, a statement uh, of his own. So <laughs> Philadelphia is, uh, is big. The, 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 it's just a big party. And if you've ever been to Philadelphia, I suspect you have, they do love a, a party. Um, but you got to get going. As I say, he's a military man uh, and he's getting a little, uh, getting a little restive here. So um, off they go. Well, of course, they can't just let it, Philadelphians can't just let it be like that. They got to send the militia and everybody all piled around them. And uh, Washington eventually, after a few miles, he says, you guys just go home and, you know, take, take care of the household and so I'm okay. It's, it's all good. Uh, we, we got it. So, so uh, uh, off he uh, goes, right? And now he's into Philadelphia. I'm sorry, in, into, uh, into New Jersey and what's coming up uh, across the river, but Trenton. And maybe if we can see that trend, this is perhaps the most um, well-known, widely circulated, it's a 19th century print um, of Washington's entry into, into, uh, into, into Trenton. Now, this is good um, for a variety of reasons. Um, um, you'll notice if you can if you squint at that thing, um, it's um, primarily uh, um, almost entirely women and girls. These are the women of Trenton and their daughters who have been ready for this moment for weeks and weeks. They've been um, getting together, they, they're, they're outfits and, 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 and um, uh, songs, 
uh, they've got they're rehearsing the songs and then the flower garlands and, and, and so on. Um, up above, you see the flags and stuff, but there's also the equivalent, uh, the, the, the sort of placards, uh, one to the effect that um, His Excellency saved us the first time, right? Battle of Trenton. Remember, and he saved the women and the daughters of, of Trenton, and now they're re re returning the favor. And so they, yeah. Washington um, crosses that bridge. It's just a little bridge there in, in Trenton, but it, it's a big bridge in the uh, national imagination, right? I don't know if national is, is right the word the right word just yet, but but almost that's that's a big bridge because a lot depended on that thing. In any case, Washington then, as you see, raises his hat. He crosses the bridge. He alights from the horse uh, and delivers a, f uh, a few words to the uh, mothers and daughters of Trenton. Right, and then on their way. Needless to say. Surrounding all of this is music and firecrackers and hullabaloos and 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 and, and so on. Now he's uh, on his way up um, to what was then called Elizabeth Town, um, uh, and then eventually onto the uh, uh, onto the water, where of course now New York, New York City, in particularly, is um, really wants a piece of that action. Right, because uh, for, for obvious reasons. So, so they've got boats of every kind out in uh, to uh, escort him along. Of course, um, on he goes out uh, uh, onto the barge. And now with, um, you know, and some of the contemporary writers, I don't know if I believe a word of it, but, you know, dolphins j jumping in. The, <laughs> you know, uh, but there's fireworks and um uh, boats with people singing like choruses and and, and so on, uh, where they uh, then usher him into the upper harbor. Now we're heading towards the battery, and then eventually um, uh, in, into New York City uh, itself. And here you see uh, something like that. Um, now the the image uh, uh, I think is entitled some uh, yeah Washington's entry into in, into New York um well was that what exactly was that him coming home from I mean back from Newburgh on his way to Mount Vernon or into hard uh, uh, hard to tell but it, I wanted to uh, have it featured because it suggests something of the um, what I would call something of the sort of the urban culture, the, I don't know if it's street culture necessarily, but there they are. New York City would have been, um, well, the, 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 seven, the 1790 census, uh, the first one puts the population of New York City right around 30,000 or so. So it's just about ready to, to move past or it has moved past uh, Philadelphia. Hard to tell, of course, because New York, like Phil, is a port city and um, the, the numbers get pretty flexible. But um, this much is clearly the case in, in when you if you dip into the, those census records and kind of the texture of, of city life into which Washington is now um, uh, ar arriving and, and asserting himself. So the city would have been um, br um, right around 30,000. Uh, Brooklyn, of course, when it went, really counted in that sense, but that Manhattan area uh, would have been right around 30,000. About 15% of that would have been a combination of enslaved and free black. Um, but there would, it would also be, uh, as, as you know, uh, being New York, uh, it would have had any, just an extraordinary diversity of languages of, of ranging from, of course, because of the Dutch influence, but it's uh, the African influence. There's uh, going to be uh, indigenous peoples. Uh, you have sort of dock culture going on there, which is always uh, a rich and crazy kind of uh, tableau going on all the way to the high enders. Um, but that's the kind of culture. And then it's party time. Uh, uh, for for that day that he arrives for into the next day, and then they they put him up in a house on on Cherry Street, which is um, by the uh, on the Manhattan side by the Brooklyn Bridge. If to, to put you in that area, kind of the Upper uh, East Side. Along let me ask let me ask a, me ask a preliminary question coming in from yeah. the audience because uh, you mentioned it a couple of times that, that Washington said a few words. 
uh, yeah. you know, and, and, and trip. Yeah. What do we know about Washington as an orator? Uh, this right. is something that, that you've studied even before this book with the Newburgh book. Yes. Uh, right, uh, thank you. Washington as orator before the inaugural address. Let's talk about right. that. Okay, before. Yeah. Yeah, right. up, up until this moment. Is Washington right. seen as a great orator? Is, right. is he a great orator? Right. So let's, um, and, and th again, this is, uh, th th that's a spot on question uh, for me at least because it sort of uh, uh, identifies one of the um, the motivations at work in, in this whole thing. And, and that is my first, I mean, I, I, um, if you'll forgive the self-referencing, but like my first book was on Edmund Burke <laughs> and then uh, Angelina Grimke and uh and then uh, and then uh, Jefferson and, and and so on. So um, okay, so there's that kind of uh, orator or, or oratory um, uh, of the sort of the full chess, you know, the Daniel Webster uh, uh, sort of thing. Well, okay, clearly Washington is not, uh, and he would never pretend to be. Um, um, now, at the same time, um, and I'll, I'll try not to go on about this, but. Um, you know, it occurred to me in, in on the Newburgh address that, you know, for all of the kind of mythology around Washington as a strong, silent type and, you know, purely a man of action and, and, and that sort of thing. Well, there is some of that. Fair enough, uh, for sure. But the man, I mean, I, I was talking to Kevin earlier, all you got to do is get to a good library and look at the Washington papers and the, the correspondence and the, and so on i mean it's incredible thousands of, this man lived his life awash in language so he was highly attuned now did he did he uh, compose all of his uh, addresses and so on himself alone no 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 and we can talk about that later if you wish so no he was not a, an orator in the ordinary sense of the word but let me follow it up just briefly along these lines. Secondly, um, one, remember, not that you, you need me to remind you, but Washington's a Virginia gentleman. And it's not altogether clear that a Virginia gentleman ought to be in order. One might say, well, what about Patrick Henry or something? Well, we can talk about the gentlemanliness of Patrick Henry, but maybe he's the, the, the exception that prove, proves the rule. Richard Henry Lee, I mean, there's a few, so I don't, I don't want to overplay this necessarily. But Virginia politics, what we know of it, did not operate through, um, uh, through uh, you know, full-throated uh, oratory. You kind of got things done differently, you know. But all of that is to say, maybe we need to expand our sense of what uh, constitutes um, or what defines uh, eloquence or or oratory? I can tell you this: when at Newburgh, for instance, in on um, uh, March 15 of of, of eighty three, when things are getting really weird, and he's got uh, virtually the entire officer uh, corps uh, uh, in that room uh, on the grounds at at, New, at Newburgh uh, with. Uh, Arguably, conspiracy on their minds. I don't know about that, but but maybe um, he walks in front of that room and he drops the hammer in front of the most powerful military uh, figures in the nation, except uh, Nathaniel Green, who's cleaning up down south. But if that's not oratory and, and the mobilizing the power of the word, I don't know what is. Um, there were indeed uh, uh, firsthand uh, reports of officers. These are hard guys, you know, uh, in tears uh, at the end of the Newburgh address. So it's, I would suggest that we ought to uh, perhaps expand our, not because I'm trying to cheerlead Washington, but to recognize that um, there is an eloquence of the, of, of character. There's an, elo an eloquence of the person that speaks, sometimes speaks with massive power. You know? Let me ask one question, and I, I wasn't uh, expecting to ask this question, but as you were describing yes. the journey, it kept coming to mind that it may be unanswerable, but when people were welcoming Washington in Philadelphia or in Trenton or even in New York, were they welcoming the new president or were they welcoming Washington? <laughs> and, and by that, I mean, would they have welcomed George Washington in the same way in 1786. I'm just curious about this. Do you have any thoughts on this? Right. It, it was, thank you for, for the question. I mean, it, um, 
you know, it would be, uh, uh, I have to be speculative uh, in a sense, because it is who were they. Um, and I hope I'm not fobbing the question to, by, by suggesting that, one, sure, he would have been, um, he's the he's the man. I mean, you know, no, no question. I mean, there is no more famous American, um, even more than Franklin. I mean, I, 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 I at this point, yes, yeah, yeah at this point, uh, of course, you know, um, that 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 he. So you know, uh, wherever he went would have been an occasion, yes. But um, they weren't welcoming. The, it seems to me a um, and this. This cuts very deep for me. Is that uh, is that they they were not and conspicuously were not welcoming a military figure in that. Mm -hmm. case. You know, did he? What, what was that? Uh, were his contributions, to put it mildly, uh, acknowledged? And so, on? of course, you know. But you look at the letters, the speeches, the the toasts. Even that was fun to look at all, all the various toasts. It's, very, very much uh, oriented toward uh, what we would, we would now call, call the, the, the presidency, you know, um, and, and he he plays that pretty, um, pretty smart. I mean, um, there is a there's these anxieties, you know, there's a Cromwell problem, uh, you know, at work here. There's the man on horsebacks, so to speak. And again, the track record on these things, um, as you know, is, is not real good. I mean, you can win the war. <laughs> But it's winning the peace that that's tough, and if you're not careful, you're gonna have a, a, a Napoleon come riding over the horizon if if, if you don't uh, play this uh, properly. So that insistence on the civil on civil authority uh, seems to me embodied in the person as well as the um, the reception of that person. Uh, extraordinarily helpful. I like that yeah. answer a lot. Let me uh, yeah. remind everyone out there, you can ask questions, type them in uh, and, and submit your questions. I want to come to as many as I can, so be asking them. Uh, we're in New York. It's late April. Uh, and uh, of course, he's about to be inaugurated. But once he arrives in New York, is there a bit of a waiting period uh, before he, he is ready to be inaugurated? And, and what does that look like? Take us up to the day of the inauguration. Right. So he uh, is it's fine. <laughs> um, uh, and it's, it's part of the fun of this whole project is kind of see if you can't transplant your, yourself in the imagination back to like, oh, okay. At some point, though, you got to, you know, you, you t uh, settle down and have a cup of tea in your new quarters and, and then kind of say, well, now what, you know, uh, sort of thing. Uh, to absolutely no one's surprise th then or now, of course, he's got a line up all the way to the, you know, to the battery uh, for people who want to talk to him. Um uh, so there's that kind of housekeeping business uh, that's going to go on. Um, uh, but I want to mention one important dimension of this. So uh, uh, figuring out, he writes to, um, uh, and again, this is in the letters, uh, the correspondence, uh, he'll write to like Madison and uh, Hamilton and several others asking him about, uh, asking them about certain protocols. Like, should I have uh, people, should I invite people over here or to my place or should I like wait uh, should I go to somebody else's place for dinner? Uh, and, and, you know, like, it's it kind of nuts and bolts, you know, because, again, um, at the risk of over, you know, of, of rehearsing this, but what's at stake here uh, is um, what a Republican government ought to look like. I mean, what are the protocols? I mean, it's not as if he's got much to go with here uh, as he looks across the, the the landscape. It's pretty like, wow. As he said famously, you know, it's like everything I do is a precedent, you know. Well, he was wrong, there, you know. So that matter. So he asked, hey, uh, Mr. Madison, what, what, what do you think about, you know, you know, which fork do you use for the salad? Uh, that, that kind of thing. Um, so there's that housekeeping and figuring out the rules of engagement, so to speak. I do want to mention, though, a, it seems to me a very, very important um, uh, dimension to all this, and it's um, of a piece with this matter of uh, what, what, after all, should a um, republic look like? And as we get to the speech itself, what should a Republic sound like, you know, yeah. but for the moment, 
of course, this goes on, I'm sure, since time out of mind. As soon as the, somebody's uh, in the chair or the office or, or is going to be, the first thing you want to do is hit them up, hit them up uh, for a job, right? <laughs> so the, the, the writings contain all these, what apparently turns out to be hundreds and hundreds of people um, who are saying, hey, uh, you know, I fought in uh, Trenton or, or Brandywine or something, and, uh, and, and the kids... Uh, uh, needs you know, some food. Um, can, can, can you see yourself a job for me, for, for a position? Uh, these come in by the bagful, as, as near as I can tell. And Washington has what turns into, uh, it's not really boilerplate. I mean, he seems to sort of adapt it, or his secretary does. Uh, but in any case, I, I promise not to read it or anything, but the upshot of these responses, they're very polite, um, but very pointed in which he uh, specifies why he can't help. He says, first of all, um, to put it, you know, uh, casually, uh, is this uh, it's not going to happen. Uh, sorry, flat out, this is never going to happen for you. Sorry, I know I appreciate your service, uh, but uh, it can't happen. It can't, and he explains why. Because the, in, in, in my situation, he says, this is tough. I have to turn away friends sometime, um, but it is absolutely crucial to the fortunes of Republican government that um, uh, that its administration um, be headed uh, by those who are competent to the task and for that reason alone. And wow. that underlines it time and time again. So his days are crowded. He himself is not a big partier, but he'll have some people over for a glass of Madeira and, and sometimes talk about the old days. But a lot of the, the days themselves are, uh, uh, I'm sure, interminable in, interviews. Remember, there's there's no cabinet, you know, th that we would recognize uh, as such. Yeah. He's trying to um, uh, figure this out uh, as he goes along. Well, let's spend a little bit of time, you and me, and then we'll go to some audience questions on the speech itself. Uh, yeah. We've had an inaugural address just this year. This is now a fixture in the American, yeah. I won't even say political calendar, the American civic calendar, uh, the inaugural yeah. address. And this is the first of them. Uh, tell me about this speech. Tell me how Washington put it together. And uh, most importantly, uh, I'm, I'm interested to hear your take on this speech as the first inaugural address was. Was okay. it transformative? Did it shape everything that came yeah. after? Was it a throwaway? Right, right. right. Good. Tell us about yeah. it. Absolutely. So, um, what are we talking about here? Uh, after all, um, uh, I th uh, President Biden's, I think, was the 59th such uh, uh, speech uh, delivered. Um, we might ask, and I promise to, res to be responsive to your question, um, but we might ask as a first order of business, a uh, why? Why, why do uh, newly installed presidents give oaths of office? They don't have to. There's nothing in the, as you know, in the Constitution. There's nothing I could find in the constitutional debates or in the ratification debates where I couldn't find a word uh, about uh, any of that. Uh, did Washington invent the inaugural address? He certainly did not. Um, uh, variations on the theme go back, of course, in the Anglo experience well into um, for, for centuries in the colonies and provinces themselves. Uh, we would see uh, 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 governors, uh, for instance, um, uh, deliver sort of um, uh, uh, you know, assumption of office uh, addresses, uh, that kind of thing. But, but Washington uh, did not have to. So why did the presidents ever uh, after? I know why, because Washington did. Um, mm -hmm. that, <laughs> uh, but uh, we, we need, um, well, the, the speech itself, um, uh, as you might imagine, what is it, uh, seven paragraphs long, about uh, 1,400 words, uh, give or take, depend which uh, version you're using. So, so it's not particularly long, uh, seven. Um, it is written in that la sort of that uh, characteristic um, 18th century uh, English, la sort of Latinate uh, s s syntactical structures and so on. So it's not a, uh, a, a particularly reader-friendly text uh, for most people these days. I mean, I love it, of course, but, but uh, I'm used to it. Now, more specifically, um, where did this address come from? Well, it came. It's it's not a peculiar route, but but it's but it's it had a bump or two. Um, 
uh, Washington seems to have asked David Humphreys, an aide of his for a long time, uh, going, going back a long time, who's pretty good, it was kind of a bad poet, but, but pretty good with the pen, uh, to, to help him out a little bit. Humphreys hands him a 70-plus page beast of a, of a manuscript. Said, what about this? Well, um, Washington says, I, you know, I, I'll, I'll get back to you. <laughs> so can, can you imagine a 70-page speech? Um, even Edmund Burke might, would blanch at, at that. So. Yeah. In any case, um, around Christmas time, um, uh, prior to the uh, inauguration itself in, in April of, of, of 89, um, uh, J James Madison stops by uh, the house uh, and um, they spend some, some time together. And um, it, it's pretty clear that uh, Washington, in effect, said, um, Mr. Madison, what do you think of this? Wash Madison seems to have taken one look at it and said, uh, you know, that's not going to happen. Uh, and the two of them bend themselves uh, to the task. And so uh, for those of you, uh, you familiar with um, Madison or, or Madison's prose craft, you can see it at, at, at work there in, uh, uh, in several ways. Um, it's that manuscript then that gets tucked into uh, uh, Washington's breast uh, pocket uh, as he assumes the, uh, um, uh, the, the office itself. He's, uh, he's, he, he takes the oath of office out on the second floor, um, uh, out on the balcony there. Uh, Livingston uh, uh, delivers it. Um, uh, huzzah, there we go. Uh, huzzah, look at all the people down below, right? Uh, and uh, Livingston says, long live George Washington, um, the president of the United States of America. Uh, uh, that, see, and then walks into the, um, th that's where uh, we might now kind of roughly call a joint session, uh, and then uh, delivers the address. Um, uh, several people in attendance uh, wrote um, um, uh, penned response. I mean, their sort of impressions. Uh, Washington seems uh, the, uh, several noticed that uh, there uh, might have been a bead of sweat or two on the brow, and maybe a, a quiver in the voice and a shaking of the hands. Back to this orator uh, question, you know, Washington. I, I don't think ever felt particularly uh, comfortable. That wasn't his zone uh, for sure, but he did it. <laughs> you know, and we talk about why, but I, but one of the legacies why is because um, it's, it is, um, I think he thought it was absolutely essential to the ethos of Republican government that power shows itself, that it speaks itself, that it lets itself be known that this isn't a European deal, or much less a French kind of thing, you know, or, a, uh, or some sort of ritual in the House of Commons or something. No, uh, power shows itself. In any case, he stands up and um, with manuscript in hand, maybe it shakes a little bit, um, but this is a pretty intense moment, right? Uh, and, and delivers the address. As I say, it's uh, disposed into um, seven uh, uh, paragraphs. So it's not not, not particularly, particularly long, um, but it is very, very pointed. Um, one of the reasons I, um, entered into the project is I was struck by the relative absence, frankly, of any serious scholarly work on um, the inauguration and much less the uh, inaugural address. And so I wanted to kind of offer my modest uh, contribution to that. Um, why? I don't know. You'd think, you'd think so. I no sense dwelling on that, but even if it was a dreadful speech, uh, <laughs> it was still the first. I mean, you so, uh, in any case. Um, but is on the it, face of it, there's no, there's no policy uh, um, initiative, although there is one thing that I think we can talk about. Um, yeah. He's not advocating for a, a series of, of bills to rectify this wrong or that wrong. Uh, the right. sorts of things you might see in some later inaugural addresses that have have an agenda, that have a, a plan, a plan of action. So, what is in this address? What's the what's the right. what's the nuts and bolts of the substance? Okay, very good. Um, um, and again, it's, it's, it's so precedent setting, but um, I think in the main we could. Um, Without getting into the weeds, but if you'll allow me, I do want to quote one sentence. If, of course. 
We want to know, hear the address, uh, of course. But, yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, it's like I say, it's, uh, by my count, it's 1,419 uh, 1, uh, words long, uh, disposed in, in, into seven paragraphs. Um, characteristically, you have that, that first paragraph, that's what rhetoricians call the ingratio, where you sort of ingratiate yourself. Um, importantly, though, um, and again, here's the precedent setting where Washington is careful to, um, as it were, um, subsume himself to the office, right? It will become a, a sort of a commonplace in inaugural addresses to greater or lesser degrees of convincingness, for sure. But as a as a kind of a standard go to, you say, uh, you know, I'm this is beyond my abilities, um, but I'll do my best, uh, kind of thing, right? And frankly, I wish I was I was back at Mount Vernon drinking flip and and uh, bouncing kids on my knees, you know. But here I am because that's what you got to do. Um, there is then a uh, an appeal to divine sanction. Um, th th it's conspicuously not a very, uh, uh, it's not a Christian language that, that he mobilizes, but for better or worse, we tend to call a sort of a deistical appeal to the divine hand and, and, and so on. And then thirdly, there's, um, it's, you're right, there's, there's no specific, not much hardly at all specific talk about um, policy because kind of unclear what that would even mean <laughs> uh, under the circumstances, but there is very much a statement of, of, of vision, right? So we know that uh, the word inauguration, uh, uh, augury is, a, is the ancient, uh, is the Latin term for, for um, seeing and predicting uh, at the, um, seeing what the lay of the land looks like when you're just starting something, right? Uh, so sort of so um, we then get um, some talk about uh, Article uh, 5 of the United States Constitution. This is perhaps where we see Madison's hand being played, in which uh, Washington reminds his audience, hey, you know, um, if things are um, – uh, don't, aren't going exactly the way you want it. Well, we can um, uh, we can deal with this with, uh, in, in, in that way um, uh, through, through, through the amendment uh, process. Um, he, he then says, "Listen, uh, uh, towards the end, um, I don't want any salary uh, for this." And then con uh, concludes with uh, again uh, uh, an appeal to divine uh, sanction. So uh, you're right. It's a very short speech. Yeah. I, I think it would yeah. feel short today, right? If, if we yeah. showed up to the inaugural address uh, in 2020 or 2024 and heard a speech of this length, we would think, wow, that's short. Yeah, I, I think so. There were shorter, not as short as you well know, uh, Dr. Butterfield, uh, of Washington's second inaugural address, which might be rather telling, was all of what, three sentences, Yeah, Kevin? Uh, one, 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 one clunky paragraph is all it was. <laughs> yeah. uh, we'll on, I, I've got an audience yeah. question, and then we can talk more about sure. the speech and, and its, its uh, effect. Um, it's, it's a great question. I actually I don't know the answer to this. Uh, was Martha Washington uh, or oh, yeah. George Washington's wife and family any part of this inaugural ceremony or the beginning of the presidency? Right, right. Um, thank you, Megan, uh, if, 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 if I may. Um, okay. Here's how that turns out. Uh, um, Martha and the gang uh, did not, in fact, accompany um, George Washington on, 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 on that journey, um, but they will come later. They've got to take care of the situation at, 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 at the house, uh, figure, figure things out. Washington himself has to find, uh, you know, uh, or get people to find for him, no, no doubt, um, staff and, and so on. Now, so to answer your question, there's no immediate uh, presence there. I think, if I may, again, maybe a little impressionistic, but it would really have been unclear, given the gender uh, dynamics uh, at play and what it meant for a, uh, a, f a, a female um, to be publicly feted like that, mm. kind of unclear. You know, uh, or should this, you know, that's, is that appropriate um, or is it not? In any case, um, well, 
after the uh, inauguration uh, ceremonies and so on, everybody wants to have a big party. And, and indeed, uh, there's no inaugural ball as such that, that we would recognize in, in, or, or a parade like, like we would think of down Pennsylvania Ave or anything. But, you know, the Spanish ambassador, the French, everybody wants, wants uh, some of this. So they'll, they'll have that. But Washington is, is um, insistent that um, they wait until uh, Martha comes up. Um, she does, and then the, and the, and the retinue, uh, including enslaved and, and staff and uh, kids of various hang and, and so on. You know, as as they'll populate the the house, but that'll be in a couple months. You know, um, yeah. Great. Uh, I have another yeah. question. Uh, the audience yeah. questions are coming in. Keep it up, uh, everyone. Yeah. Please. I'm enjoying these questions. Another question that we have is about uh, his military uniform. Uh, did oh, he yeah. wear his military uniform during the trip, uh, as indicated by some of the images? And as you mentioned, uh -huh. you know, there, some of these are 19th century images. Uh, but uh, did he travel by carriage until nearing a town when he would mount a big white horse before arriving? I think this is something that we know he did on occasion. I don't know if it was in this trip. Tell yeah. us about these things. Sure. Um, well, you know, um, again, for all of the kind of the stern – Washington, uh, all of that. Um, the man liked a nice jacket. <laughs> and we know this uh, in part because he actually, uh, there's letters, uh, 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 an exchange where uh, when he knows, uh, you know, the inaugurations coming coming up on the horizon there, he, he writes to Knox and says, hey, um, can you help me find, uh, there's this tailor up there, I, th I think it was in Connecticut, you know, who does a really, does really nice work, you know, can you, can you get him my, my proportions? Because he's a big guy, obviously, and it's not easy, but uh, with a nice brown kind of wool thing going on here. So, and, and he, he's always uh, attentive to that. Now, um, as to, um, so what, so what? Well, actually, a lot, because given what we're talking about in terms of the theater of power and kind of the, the, the choreography of Republican government, one's got to pay attention to one's clothes, as Jefferson was to find out uh, at, at a later day. It's not altogether appropriate for the president of the United States of America to open the door in his slippers, you know, like, what the heck? Um, Washington was much more formal uh, along those lines. Now, specifically, did he once in a while don his military uniform? I don't know. Uh, I, I don't. I, I haven't come across uh, commentary or observations to that effect. Frankly, this, the imagery aside, I would be surprised, um, and maybe I'm biased on this matter, but my. Uh, I, but I think formed um, sense is that um, it would um, it would uh, be he would have thought it inappropriate to um, uh, civil government for the um, president elect of the United States of America to go to the ball dressed in military uniform. That's not. That's Very not good. Yeah, well, this is this is helpful and and. and yeah. Questions are continuing to come in. I've got another yeah, one. Great. That I, I, I love this question because it's something that I think there's a lot of answers to. Um, yeah. One of them I, I, I know right off. Where did Washington learn his yeah. theatrical sense? Uh, yeah. I, I, and the answer, I'll just throw out part of it. I, I, I know that he loved going to the theater. He actually enjoyed watching plays. But tell us more about this. Yeah, and indeed, if uh, – if, um, uh, no reason not to believe it, but sort of the staging of, of plays at uh, at um, uh, um, Valley Forge and, and, and uh, Cato is what I'm stumbling here. Yeah. Uh, Addison's Cato and, and and so on. Okay, um, you Virginians out there, uh, Southerners perhaps in general, will understand that. Um, to have come of age under his circumstances was to have come of age in, in a time of exquisite um, protocols. Uh, that and, and we know from the, like, like the book on the rules of civility and, and, and so on, one can kind of over, overplay that a little bit. But one did have to know really early on um, sort of the, the arts of, of, um, uh, of how to navigate uh, in powerful company. Now, sometimes that might include uh, taking uh, dancing. You got to know how to move your body. 
especially if you're a big guy like, like Washington was, it was important to develop a sort of an athleticism um, in terms of even how you sat down, how you danced, that kind of thing, you know, that, that, that mattered. You, you had to be, there, had, there was a sense of comportment. Okay, well, but think too uh, of, the, of the military experience, especially his early formative military experience before the American Revolution or, or the War of Independence. Um, meaning what? Well, I think he, under, he, he was taught early on that this management of yourself before others that really matters. <laughs> um, and one can uh, lament it or, or celebrate it, but he understood the, the art of theatricality, as, as it's put here, is the art of appearances. And Washington understood the power of appearances, not in so much in some abstract theoretical terms, but in part, for instance, because that's is how you get things done properly. So this is what famously sort of mortified him when he showed up in uh, in Boston. Remember, you know, <laughs> to take over what can you know charitably be called the, the the army, the American army in Boston. You know, he was mortified at the he wandering around looking at like uh, um, superior uh, officers giving uh, inferior uh, uh, you know the men in the ranks haircuts and shave you know in camp you know get kind of bored. He put a stop to that in a hurry. You know, I don't think because he had some sort of some obsessive authoritarian thing going on. It's just, just that um, that just looks bad because you know, when the time's going to come when uh, the guy giving you a haircut, he might be sending you into the front line. So we better get this straightened out uh, real quick here. It's the art of appearances. Well, uh, there's one more question I, I, that I, I'll let them, it's coming in from the audience, but it's, it's one that I, I, I was hoping to touch on briefly uh, with your skill in evaluating rhetoric and, and, the, and the performance side of things um, is this the relationship between this uh, Margo has a great question uh, is relating this inaugural address to the oh. even more famous farewell address uh, and uh, I know for a fact that school children were learning excerpts from, and, and yeah. huge chunks of the farewell address for more than a century after the inaugural address, maybe a little less so, but how do you compare the two? Do they have some common themes or are there uh, yeah. distinct differences? This question deserves a pause, if you don't mind. That's great. Because <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's a good one. Um, in my view, aside from the obvious differences of content and, and, and context, what impresses me is the distinction between the fundamental optimism that I see embedded in every word of the first inaugural address. And I read the, um, the farewell address, not so, maybe perhaps as pessimistic, but an address um, by someone, it was never delivered, of course, uh, orally, uh, but sure. by someone who's had a very rough stretch of it. Uh, maybe not so much in terms of failure or, or anything like that. I mean, th th all that's arguable, but um, I'll put it this way: you'll notice in the first inaugural address, there is not one single word about foreign, what we would call foreign policy. At mm. the time, um, he turned, uh, you know, he opened that door uh, to his office, and it just never stopped. Uh, if he looked east. He had that whole thing going on. If you look west, he had indigenous uh, uh, t tensions uh, at, at work. Look north and south, everywhere he, you know. Secondly, it, there's a kind of a, a hard one. Um, again, not, I wish I had a better word than pessimism, but because uh, he wasn't possessed of a pessimistic mind, but, but there's almost a, a kind of a, of a winsomeness or something, a, a kind of a, um, of, uh, mellowing where um, everything that he'd hoped for, that business about uh, party and factions and all, mm -hmm. that true. Um, uh, and and but, but the reason I'm stumbling here is because I, I don't know personally, but 
Um, Washington, in some sense, he's older, he's wiser, he's got a few scars on him now. Um, and I think he might have been feeling very 18th century. <laughs> what he saw was a world that was rapidly, if it hadn't already been coming on, that was um, deeply inscribed by uh, considerations of faction, power, uh, 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 personal interests, uh, uh, th 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 that kind of thing. Um, those were, it was a rough couple of administrations on, on that score, at least, you know. Um, this has been a great conversation, Stephen. Uh, the, the book, uh, everyone out there, is the first inauguration, uh, George Washington and the Invention of the Republic. Uh, it came out just last year. Excited about this this existing because we needed to know more about this address. I agree with you completely. Yeah. That too little has been written about this subject. And, uh, and of course, it sets the stage for so much of what comes later. Uh, thank you for writing the book. Thanks for sitting down with us. I would love to welcome you to Mount Vernon someday soon. So find your oh, way down here when you can. I'm coming. Thank you so much and to, to, to you again and 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 everyone and, and who, who, who logged on and I really appreciate it. Well, thank, thank you, Stephen. And thank you everyone out there for joining us tonight for our April Ford Book Talk. I hope to see you in, in the month of May. We have some exciting programming coming up and we will see you again soon. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much.